All right, everyone. I think we'll get started here. First of all, thank you so much to everybody who's come out tonight. We really appreciate you guys joining us for these sessions. For anybody who's new here or ended up here by accident, these are part of our weekly Monday night training sessions put on by St. John Ambulance Div 176 here in Victoria. My name is David. I'm an officer in the training department here. Uh, as we're getting into the fall here, we've uh, wanted to start getting deeper dives into some of the bigger topics here and moving a little bit past the standard MFR level. And so this is part of that series here. We're very lucky to have Bobby Bennett here presenting tonight and I'll let her introduce herself in just a moment. Right, these sessions are all recorded and posted to our YouTube channel within a few days of these, uh, the, each session happening. So especially if you're like me and chunks of it get a little bit confusing, there's always the opportunity to go back and rewatch it in a few days and try and understand better that way. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, we ask that you put them into the chat box there and we'll let Beth Bobby answer them. Uh, we ask that you guys do refrain from trying to answer questions in the chat just because we've had some issues with less than accurate answers being shared there and causing a little bit of confusion there. Uh, everybody's video is turned off and you're muted. We ask that you keep it that way up until the end. Uh, once the presentation's over, we'll uh, have a bigger, a bit more time to ask questions. And if it gets to the point that you have a question that might be easier to ask through voice, we can cross that when we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, that's all I have to say. I'll turn it over to Bobby here. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me. My name's Bobby Bennett. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the emergency room in Victoria General Hospital and Royal Jubilee Hospital. I also um, work with the Canadian Armed Forces. I'm the clinical teaching instructor for the medics in British Columbia and for the search and rescue technicians. Um, I am going to be doing a very broad topic tonight, and so we're going to—it's—it's it's more it's going to be an overview. We'll try not to get lost in the weeds too much. Um, let me know if there's any problems hearing or seeing me. I am following off Dr. Chima's uh, presentation that he did for you a, two weeks ago, I believe. He stuck specifically kind of to cardiac oxygen supply and demand. And we're, I'm gonna build off that. Um, so if you didn't see it, if, I, if I'm a little quick in that area, you can go back and you can watch his. And he's, he went quite into depth with it. So the idea here, I can get my computer to cooperate. There we go. Is that it's we're not going to focus on one system so much as the entire body. When something happens, it doesn't have to happen to the heart or to the lungs. It, when it happens anywhere in your body, something like trauma or infection, basically anything that changes um, the body's need to, for oxygen, um, you see changes happen as the body tries to supply more oxygen to the area that's having an issue. Um, a lot of these changes start very early and if you know how to recognize them and understand why they're happening, then what it can do is allow you to intervene appropriately early, which is the best time to try and, try and start fixing problems before it gets out of control. I am trying to stay, I work in the critical care unit as well and the CCU, the Cardiac Critical Care Unit, um, which is where most of my experience with this is coming from. They have the advantage of having their patients hooked up to every, every machine imaginable. And um, that what they do is they will recognize these early signs and adjust, but that doesn't mean that it can't be practical in the field. And I'm going to try and make this more, more relevant to what you'll see pre-hospital. So how does the body supply oxygen to, how does, well, how does your, how do your cells get oxygen? It's a mixture of uh, cardiac, pulmonary, and oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. And I'm just going to get into here quickly. So I've got cheat notes over here. Um, and so what it is when, as you're obviously you're breathing in, you bring oxygen into your body and you get that, your heart then circulates that oxygenated blood around your body via the blood, which is, and we'll get into each of those areas and how they supply the body. And then we'll talk about what causes increased demand for oxygen and the ways that we can intervene in different situations. So again, I'm going to maybe race over the cardiovascular a little bit because Dr. Shima covered it. 
but one of the big things to remember is that your cardiac output, your body's ability to circulate blood around um, is your stroke volume times your heart rate. Your stroke volume is made up of your preload, your afterload, your contractility. So that simply put, preload is how much blood is in the heart um, right before it goes to pump it into the body. Afterload has to do more with how much it, resistance your heart actually has to get over in order to do that. So things that make your arteries smaller or cause vasoconstriction increase that afterload. Um, contractility being how, how much your heart can expand and then push back against that, the force of the afterload. And they're all very intertwined. Preload, obviously, the more blood that gets into the heart makes the heart stretch more, making it um, increasing the contractility and then the contractility pushing out against the afterload. If there's lower afterload, you'll get more blood out to the body. If there's higher, then you'll get less. Um, and so how does your heart compensate? It's specific, it, your heart doesn't necessarily need to be having a problem for it to start compensating for another issue in the body. So what does it do? It tries to increase the amount of blood getting around the body. Um, and so we're going to talk about cardiovascular systems. So it's not just the heart. We're talking about the vasculature does as well, just meaning your arteries and your veins. Um, so essentially, the first thing it does here, the first thing it does is it speeds up your heart rate because if cardiac output is a result of um, of your sorry, my brain's not working here, your stroke volume and heart rate, step number one, speed up that heart rate because that should then make more blood go around the body. The problem with this is that if the heart rate becomes too fast, it decreases when we talk about that preload, the ability of the heart to fill up with the blood, um, you're actually going to eventually lessen the amount of blood that you have circulating around your body. Um, also, your sympathetic nervous system is going to cause vasoconstriction. We talk about that vasculature. And so you'll see that in pale, cool extremities, weaker, potentially have weaker pulses um, peripherally. So you're talking about your pedal pulses and a narrowing pulse pressure is something. So when you take a blood pressure, you have your systolic and you've got your diastolic levels. The diastolic, if it comes up, is in response to the narrowing of those arteries, that vasoconstriction. So that could be a sign. You may have a normal blood pressure, but if you've got a narrowing pulse pressure, that you're getting vasoconstriction. And so that is essentially, if we go back here, when you have that vasoconstriction, it increases that afterload. The afterload being increased, um, what the idea being that it gets more blood back to the heart so the heart can continue to circulate it. So that increases preload. When preload increases, it should increase contractility. And so you've got this system of how the heart responds in an attempt to increase the amount of oxygenated blood circulating around your body. So how to assess the fact that we've got these changes happening. Um, we lovingly refer to uh, our, uh, an assessment tool we use in the emergency room as the emergency handshake. Just take the person's hand, shake the person's hand. Literally by touching their hand, you can feel if it's cool, you can see if it's pale, you can put your pointer finger on the radial pulse. You can feel the radial pulse. Is it faster than it should be? Is it weaker than it should be? Uh, Moisture is a big one. As soon as the cardiac system starts doing anything or it starts, um, starts being in distress, people have a tendency to become diaphoretic or start sweating. Um, and it's as simple as that. One of the things that this is my own kind of assessment tool that I like to do, if you stand at the at the patient's feet. You take off their shoes, have a feel of the pedal pulses. That gives you a good idea whether they are, um, whether, whether, okay, whether they're circulating blood around their body as well, because the feet are the farthest away from the heart. Those pedal pulses are the first thing that's going to start weakening if you're shunting blood to the heart. Um, and then you've got a good central look at that person. You're looking them right up and down. And this can tell you a lot because you can see how their chest is expanding. And specifically for the cardiac system, you can notice things like jugular venous distension. 
Um, if somebody's leaning backwards about 30 degrees, they sh shouldn't have, you shouldn't be able to see their uh, jugular veins sticking out of their neck. If your heart is experiencing difficulty, if you've got backup, so essentially that preload is backing up because of it's not getting into the heart, the heart's not effectively circulating it, you'll actually see those jugular veins distended. Um, edema in the feet is another good sign that the cardiac system is struggling. Also anxiety, one of the very first signs that people start to feel when they're increasing the amount of oxygen they need and their body's responding is anxiety, or which can come even just in the form of someone having difficulty staying still, feeling distressed, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the pulmonary system. Again, we've kind of flipped right through that cardiac system, but Dr. Chima's uh, <clears throat> PowerPoint covered that really in a great amount of detail. So the pulmonary system, I don't know for anyone, we'll go over like a, an, an overview of the anatomy just for anyone who's not completely familiar. Obviously, you have your main airway that you bring oxygen into your body and it gets into your lungs through these smaller and smaller airways, your bronchi and your bronchioles, and it gets down to your alveoli, these little sacs, these little bubbles here. And these bubbles are all covered, as you can see in this network of veins and, <laughs> veins and arteries. The interesting thing about the vein and the lungs is that it's actually bringing oxygenated blood in from the heart, and the artery is bringing deoxygenated blood um, back because it's, there's one place in the body that that's flipped. And so where we get into trouble, a lot of the time you, there's a couple different places that you can have a problem in your pulmonary system when you're trying to get oxygen into your system that we need to worry about as far as are we supplying the body with enough oxygen. And so ventilation is the exchange of air between the lungs and the atmosphere. So specifically, are you getting air and filling all these little sacs, the alveolar sacs up. And that can obviously, if you have a pneumonia, if you have a pneumothorax, if you've got something that's actually, or even just a, a foreign body, if, if you're blocking the flow of oxygen, then you're going to have a problem with ventilation. Now you might have perfectly fine ventilation and you may have a perfusion problem. The perfusion is the ability of the blood to actually reach the air, um, the alveoli in the lungs where that oxygenated air is being brought in. And so perfusion being the movement of the blood in. So something like a pulmonary embolus can affect that. Um, and so we have, we, we talk about ventilation perfusion mismatches, which is termed VQ mismatching for some strange reason, um, which is, oh, it can be a little bit confusing. If you see that, all they're talking about is, is there a problem between ventilation or perfusion? And so if you have an, a ventilated area that isn't getting any blood to it, you're not getting oxygen into the body. If you've got a perfused area that's not getting any oxygenated air into it, you're still not going to get any oxygen into the blood in order to supply it to the cells in the body. Diffusion, the last one, is actually the, then the movement of that, the gases from that oxygenated blood, or the gases from the deoxygenated blood. I apologize. <laughs> Ventilated areas of the lung pushing gases, specifically oxygen, this is what we're worried about, getting into that blood um, and then the CO2, the carbon dioxide from the blood being able to move into the lungs so that you can expel it. And so you can have issues here as well, because if you, you can be ventilated and perfused, but if you have say fluid collecting in your lungs, it causes the membrane, which is very, very thin. It's about one cell thick on each side. It causes um, edema there. And then you might have perfectly perfused lungs and perfectly ventilated lungs, but it's not allowing the oxygen to move across that membrane. One of the things we do, one of the most common interventions here is for us to give supplementary oxygen because what happens is that it increases the pressure, the gas pressure 
of the oxygen when there's more oxygen in the ventilated lungs to push harder for it to move across into the blood. And so when we start talking about problems with oxygen supply, this is what we get into quite a bit. Um, and knowing where the problem is coming from helps you to decide what intervention. Because again, if you have an area that's not perfused, um, if, you're, if you're not actually getting blood into the lungs and moving through the lungs, then it's not necessarily going to help for you to pump a whole bunch of oxygen in there. What you need to do is, is reperfuse the area. Um, and a common I find an interesting misconception is you'll have a lot of people listen to the lungs if the lungs sound fine on assessment then oh everything sounds fine it must be fine if you have a perfusion problem not a ventilated problem your lungs are going to sound not they're going to sound absolutely clear if you have a pulmonary embolism you're not going to listen and hear something so just because your um, auscultation your assessment of the lungs is good doesn't mean that that's not where the problem is coming from so what actually happens when your body, let's say your lungs aren't the problem, lungs are great, they're perfused, they are oxygen, they're getting, they're ventilated, the diffusion's fine. If your body's experiencing something like trauma, stress, then what you're going to, your lungs are still going to react to that, even if there's nothing, if the problem's not there. Ideally, the problem isn't there, so you can get more oxygen to the area that needs it. And what happens is the chemoreceptors in and there's various chemoreceptors, there's peripheral and central. There's some in your aortic arch and your carotid bodies, and then there's some in your brain. And they react to the levels of CO2 and oxygen. Um, and the, the biggest thing you're going to see is an increased respiration rate. And it's the earliest sign as well. If you have something starting to happen, if you have um, a head injury, for example, or if somebody has an infection that is becoming systemic, or even an allergic reaction, what you're going to see is an increased respiration rate first. It's a very early sign. And if you can, on our assessments, we, we tend to just like to say that, oh yeah, breathing's fine, 16. People don't often count. If you do an actual assessment of your respiration rate, you will pick up on those early changes and you can intervene quite a bit faster. The depth of respirations can also change. Um, if you look at the, there's a, a lot of different things that can happen depending on whether it's trauma or a head injury. They talk about respirations up, down. It's less important necessarily for you to tell exactly what the depth, why the depth of change, just that either it's shallow or it's deep. If people are becoming acidotic, you'll get these big deep breaths as they're trying to push carbon dioxide out of the system because that's how we change the pH balance in our body. Um, what you do need to know is that if you've got shallow respirations or irregular quick respirations, it's not actually necessarily going to help with that oxygen supply. The body responds by making them faster, but if the depth isn't, isn't enough, you're not um, ventilating, we get back to ventilation, you're not ventilating the bases of the lungs, which is where the majority of that the alve alveoli and the blood exchange is happening. And so you want to be getting as much air in as you can. This, a good example of this is hyperventilation. When somebody becomes really upset and they start breathing far too quick and they're shallow and they get these fast shallow respirations, um, it's not actually helpful. And so it's a simple thing you can do is talk somebody into slowing those respirations, making them deeper. Um, and again, your sympathetic nervous system, the same way that its change in the cardiac system is to cause vasoconstriction so that you get more blood return to the heart and to the lungs. Um, it causes the airways to dilate so that you can get more, more oxygen to your lungs. Um, now, if they don't, if you're having, um, if you're, having a difficulty with that, then you're going to get ventilation problems and you're not going to get enough oxygenated air in for the increased amount of oxygen that your body's requiring at the time. Um, good examples of things that can cause problems are when you have asthma or reactive airways, somebody's having an allergic reaction, then your body needs more oxygen and it's 
not able to get it into the alveoli so that it can push the oxygen into the blood. And so that's when you need to recognize that that's when these people need something to either open the airways or give them supplemental oxygen. We talk about these chemoreceptors just quickly and try not to get too much into the weeds with any one specific thing. But the chemoreceptors, um, when we pump a bunch of supplemental oxygen into somebody because we see the changes of someone's respirate becoming faster and somebody getting pale and cool, we want to pump a bunch of oxygen into them. The problem is because the body senses the change of its, it, it, it essentially goes, okay, we've got enough oxygen now, excellent. And then that changes how your lungs and your vasculature reacts. And we know that you're, you won't have as much of a dilation of your arteries. So you need to be careful with myocardial infarctions and strokes specifically, or pulmonary embolisms, because if you've got, um, if you've got a blockage somewhere and you put a whole bunch of supplemental oxygen into somebody and it causes the arteries to tighten instead of dilate, you can actually make that worse. And that's why we've recently changed it so that, not recently, I guess, but in the last couple of years, we've started going away from pumping a bunch of supplemental oxygen into someone. The important thing to recognize is that these changes are coming from the demand being increased. It's not necessarily that you're having a problem. Your body's reacting and it's providing the oxygen. And if they're not having a problem oxygenating, then you don't need to provide a ton of the supplemental oxygen. It, um, it, it, it can vary depending on what the issue is. So again, if we start back at the person's feet and you look up at the person, if you're standing, you can look at them centrally. You've now looked at their neck. You can look at whether they've got JVD, you felt their pulse. You can also watch the respiration rate, their depth, the regularity, chest rise, if this is a trauma problem. Looking at them from that kind of like up and down, you can see if one area is rising where it, uh, more so than the other. Listening, if someone's having a lot of problems, I don't know if when you guys are out, if you have stethoscopes, obviously a good listen to, on the, not just on the front, we like, we get a little bit lazy. If you wanna actually listen to those lower lobes, you're gonna go and listen in the back. But if someone's very wheezy, or wet, you can hear that just by getting close to them. A lot of the time, someone having an anaphylactic reaction, for, for instance, or children in particular, you can see them, you can actually hear them um, with having strider is an upper airway problem or wheezes, which is lower airways. Kids will indraw where as soon as they take that big deep breath in, you'll see indrawing coming from um, like a tracheal tug or in drawing near the ribs. If you can, you don't want to cause anyone cold, but if you can get a good look at someone breathing without something covering their chest, it can help. If adults start in drawing, it's a, a really big problem. Um, and I, we covered this point, I think, with the, it, um, if it sounds fine and things aren't working, then you could potentially have a perfusion problem. Um, also, again, coming back to the point that I made before, you're going to see this just because the lungs are working harder. It doesn't mean that the problem is with the lungs. If someone's breathing quickly, um, if someone's trying to get oxygen in, what this tells us is that they need more oxygen because the demand has been increased somewhere. And this is the body's overall response. So just because you see that tachycardia, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are having a heart problem just because you see this um, the quick respirations, it doesn't mean you're having a respiratory problem. This is your body's overall response to try and provide that oxygen to wherever is not getting enough of it. And so kind of a, an important thing to mention here is, let's say we're getting the blood into the lung, we're getting the air into the lungs, we're getting the oxygen into the blood, and the heart is pumping the blood around the body. If your body isn't, um, or your blood specifically, isn't carrying that oxygen or is altered in how the oxygen is being carried, then you're also gonna have a problem with your oxygen supply. A really simple example of this is your hemoglobin. If you are anemic, if you have low hemoglobin or you're bleeding, um, you're, it, it doesn't matter if everything else is working effectively because your blood isn't actually taking that oxygen and supplying it to your body. 
Now, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve too much because it's a bit complicated and confusing, but essentially we, there are certain things that will make your blood more likely to pick up and hold oxygen or less likely to pick up and hold oxygen. The idea about less likely to pick up and hold oxygen is if your body, if there's something somewhere that needs oxygen more, and um, this can change by pH level in the blood, changes by temperature. Um, it, I'm trying to remember the last one, sorry, my notes are, I can't see my notes that I've got on the PowerPoint that I had all nicely written out because I've got the, the view up so that you guys can see it. Um, so when you get colds or if you get, or your pH changes you're, and you don't need as much oxygen in your, in your cells, your hemoglobin will actually hold onto it harder. That being said, if your body, if you've got more, um, more carbon dioxide in your body, you've got higher acidity in your body, or if you're hot, your temperature rises, your hemoglobin will actually release easier the oxygen that it's carrying so that it can give it to the cells. Now, the one problem with this, if you think about it, is that in the lungs, it's not necessarily going to pick it up as well. So if you've got somebody who's hyperthermic or who's acidotic um, or who's got hypercapnic, so too much CO2 in the body, then it's a good time to think about giving that supplemental oxygen because you need to get it to pick up the oxygen in the lungs and then carry it to wherever you're not, um, not receiving enough. There we go. Um, not receiving enough oxygen. And so this is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Um, you don't, it's not necessarily something that pre-hospital you need to memorize. It's more so just important to understand that how much carbon dioxide is in your body, the pH of your body and the temperature can actually shift your body's ability to carry that oxygen. And so, and then to understand that if, you have something going wrong in your body, your body needs more oxygen. Your body's gonna respond by trying to increase the amount of oxygen it's getting to those cells so that they don't get damaged. And that can be affected by, the, um, by these variables. So what increases oxygen demand? Uh, easy, it's, it's anything that increases metabolic demand. Um, the big main ones you're gonna see are stress, physiological stress, which is anytime you have a trauma, anytime you have a surgery, um, anytime you have an infection. Now, it's also emotional though. Just because someone's maybe not physically um, hurt doesn't mean that you aren't gonna see an increase in how much oxygen the body needs because somebody's emotionally, dis emotionally distressed as well. Temperature, um, if you're hot, if you've got a fever, if you're hyperthermic, you're gonna need more oxygen for all the cells in your body and level of activity. Uh, so obviously you're running, you need more oxygen. These things become important when you see somebody who has, let's say someone having a heart attack is quite distressed, they're very anxious. If they want to get up, they wanna move people who experience trauma walk in, like, I don't know if you've ever seen someone in the first stages of shock after a car accident or after a disaster. Are they sitting still? Not often. One of the big things you, that you can kind of, you start practically putting the supply versus demand together here is that if that person is hurt or that person is stressed, they need more oxygen. The last thing we want them to do is increase the body's need for oxygen further. That's why you want to sit them down. We always talk about getting the person down, getting the person to the right position. Um, and it's important. This is kind of practically speaking why that's important because what we want to do is make sure we're getting oxygen, enough oxygen to the cells in the body and it's not gonna help if they're increasing the amount that they need. Positioning being, I'll get into here, positioning being a really important thing to think about just in as far as where, um, where what area does need more oxygen if we're talking about a trauma or something like that. But not just that, if you think about, we talked about cardiac, um, your body is taking the blood away from the periphery, 
to get it centrally so that you can get enough blood to the areas that are really important. Your brain being a really good one. And that's why we lay people down. If you're having trouble, if you're seeing someone become very vasoconstricted or if someone's bleeding and now we're not able to get oxygen to those really important parts, the best way to get that oxygenated blood to the area that needs the oxygen is to lay them flat, right? We want to get to the brain. That being said, that's not the best way to improve the oxygen supply in the lungs. When you position somebody specifically um, where the blood goes, so if you sit somebody up, the blood will primarily be in the bases of the lungs, which is ideal because that's where most of those alveoli are. And so that's when we see a someone short of breath, we sit them straight up. And so what you need to do then, like these are very easy things that you can do in the field. You have somebody who's having a problem if they're not getting enough oxygen, positioning them so that they ventilate better or positioning them so that they get more blood, uh, more of that oxygenated blood to the area where they need it. And positioning then goes with having them sit as well and decrease that activity. Um, you start recognizing these signs of compensation. So again, just because someone's, just because you can't see what's going on with somebody, you don't know the, the problem is, if you recognize that that respiration rate is coming up, that that heart rate is coming up, that they look pale, right? These are, it, it doesn't, you don't need to diagnose right at that time exactly what the problem is. What you need to understand is something's going on because the demand for oxygen's increased which means we need to get an increased supply of oxygen to those cells. So um, go start with your ABCs always as far as airway, breathing, circulation. If you recognize these signs of compensation, this is a good time to decide that maybe that person needs supplemental oxygen or maybe they need an IV. I think that's out of I know that you have a widely, widely varied uh, experience base. And so it's a little bit hard. I'm trying to apply this to everybody. Um, and then we kind of talked about using supplemental oxygen as well. For the most part, we understand when we see these signs of compensation, the need for that for oxygen is higher and we can help by increasing that partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs so that more of it gets into the blood, more of it gets taken to the cells. The one important time that this is something that we don't jump on is when we suspect that there is a block, that something's being blocked somewhere like a myocardial infarction or a stroke. So if you're seeing signs and symptoms of those things and the person has normal, uh, between 95 and 100% oxygen on an SpO2, you don't need to get crazy about throwing more oxygen at them. So which is an important point getting into the vital signs. We talked about how a couple of things that make it really important to understand that vital signs are not your be all end all. So we talked about narrowing pulse pressure when you start seeing that vasoconstriction because the body's making up for the fact that it needs to get more blood centrally, you'll see a normal blood pressure, but that doesn't mean that everything's okay because they have a normal blood pressure. Or for instance, if you have somebody who doesn't have enough hemoglobin or whose hemoglobin is taken up by say carbon monoxide and so oxygen can't attach to the hemoglobin, you are going to see a normal SpO2. That doesn't mean everything's all right. Um, kind of going through this, the big thing is to have a very solid assessment like you, it, and everyone has a different way of doing it. I kind of touched on mine where I like to stand at the patient's feet, put your hands on the patient's pedal pulses and take a couple minutes to just sit there and watch them and look at what they're doing. They could have rock solid vital signs, but if you're seeing these signs and symptoms, even if you don't see an obvious reason for them, then that means that you need to start intervening. You need to understand that there is an increased demand somewhere. Um, trusting your gut. Those, the vital signs, the vital signs are a tool and they're not, they're also not the first thing to do. So when we talk about rec once you recognize signs of a problem, you have that person sitting down, you're starting with your ABCs, In interventions such as, um, well, such as positioning, such as getting an IV, such as stabilizing their temperatures, whether it's about heating them up, cooling them down, 
these things actually affect change. Vital signs don't affect change. They affect how you react to the person. Um, and so often you see people in the emergency room, um, pre-hospital throwing those vital signs on first. If you see something going on and you, and you understand why these things are happening, then you can start affecting change first and you can get those vital signs afterwards. Um, I actually managed to get through that a little bit faster than I meant to. Does anyone have any questions? There's a couple, I know that I whipped through a couple of fairly complicated topics and I'm happy to talk about them now and I can go back in the slides. I, um, I didn't want to get too deep in the weeds for and, and confuse people, but I, uh, I can, we, we can do it now if you like. Yeah, we've, we've got one question in the chat here. So a lot of the time during assessment, if we notice abnormal respiration rates or rhythms, we tell patients to consider just breathe normally. So given that that might cause someone to change the way that they're breathing or like work to change the regulate the way that like their rate and rhythm, maybe masking that vital sign, like, would you suggest any better way to tell people that? Would you have a better, better language for that? Uh, I always try and get people to, I mean, in through the nose and out through the mouth and count to three in through the nose, count to three out through the mouth. When you're assessing the respiration rate, you wanna try and do it before you get them to change it. Um, but uh, concentrating on that in the nose, out the mouth, because telling someone to breathe normally, I find, especially if they're distressed, what I didn't really address here is that we're assuming that everybody here is reasonable and calm, which very rarely they are they when you encounter them. Um, and you have to know that that increase in respiration rate might be due to emotional stress as well. So if you can get them to calm down as well, it's useful to see then what that respiration is after. Um, but if they're stressed, giving them something to focus on and something to concentrate on. So instead of just breathe normally, one, two, three in, one, two, three out, one, two, three in, and it will distract them. And I find that'll also help with that anxiety. That's great. Did anybody else have any other questions there? You can fire them into the chat. I can't see the chat box for some reason. I think if you look down at the bottom there where the screen share button was on that little menu bar, there should be a chat box right beside there. Mm -hmm. Might be because I think you're looking in PowerPoint there now, but. There we go. In drawing, absolutely. Um, it's in drawing happens more so in children. You will see it as a late sign in um, shortness of breath with adults, and at that at that point, it's not. You know that you're really far gone. In drawing is when you take a big deep breath in. And it actually, you'll actually see it pull the skin into the ribs, into the trachea, um, in under the clavicles. And it's, they're, they're trying so hard to breathe. They're working so hard to breathe and they're bringing their chest out so much um, that, that you can actually see things get drawn in as the pressure changes. And so that for children, and that's one of the big things. If you ever see a child doing that, um, they do need to, that it's a, it's an earlier sign in children of very bad things. Um, it means that they are working really hard to breathe. One of the key, key aspects of ventilation for oxygen supply is that your respiratory muscles are working properly and that your chest is intact. Kids don't have very developed respiratory muscles and so you'll see them tire out more quickly than adults they can only maintain breathing quickly and deeply for short periods of time um, and then so kids will make kids will compensate and then all of a sudden not compensate and they'll get very sick very quickly whereas adults will kind of slowly decompensate um, and so that in drawing is a is a good sign in children that there is something wrong and that they are having difficulty breathing. Um, 
clinical signs for VQ mismatch? Uh, it varies from presentation to presentation. And it's more so something that like, it's understanding the ventilation versus, versus perfusion um, is important, but until you actually, it's not something that in the field or in an emergency, you're going to sit there and try and, and figure out necessarily. Uh, like looking for a sign for a pulmonary embolus, you have somebody whose chest sounds good and who's obviously ventilating well, but for some reason they're still hypoxic. Um, you're still seeing signs of the fact that they're not getting oxygen. You can't necessarily, particularly pre-hospital, rule out other signs, other reasons that they're not getting, um, that, that they're not perfusing properly. Does that, does that make sense? Like, I think for VQ mismatch, you'd have to go through each, each diagnosis and kind of talk about it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, makes sense. Um, well, we'll give some folks a couple more minutes here to put questions into the chat, but just while we give them their chance there. Uh, thank you, everybody, again, for coming out. We really appreciate it. As we mentioned earlier, these are going to be recorded. We'll have it up on our YouTube video and a few, our YouTube channel in a few days, and we will be emailing the links out to those as well. If you're not already on our email list, if someone shared this link to you and you want to join into these, these do happen every Monday night at seven o'clock. You can send me a message here with your email address, and I'll happily add you onto our list. Otherwise, if anyone else has other questions, you can send them in now, or we'll wrap it up. Well, thank you so much, Bobby, for your time. We really appreciate it. It was a fantastic presentation. No problem. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out.